Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. Today I have a review for you of this uh, Audio Quest uh, Dragonfly uh, Cobalt. Uh, I guess Cobalt Blue. Uh, this comes in three different versions. Uh, standard one, which I think is gray, then or black, I forget. Then there's a red one, and then this is the Cobalt one. And the uh, price incrementally goes up. Um, as you get to this one. This is uh, $300 for this uh, little thing. So uh, quite expensive. It doesn't look or feel any different than the cheaper ones. Maybe it feels a little bit more uh, glossy, but at any rate, it's not something you're going to look at every day uh, on this thing. So uh, for $300, it better be a darn good uh, dongle um, because uh, you can get really nice ones now for $75 to $100. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with this, this category of device, on one side there's a USB connection and on the other side there's a headphone jack. Internally there's a DAC in there, digital to analog converter, and a headphone amplifier. The two combined are designed to produce better performance than you can get out of your headphone jack out of your laptop. Uh, or if you have a phone that still has a headphone jack, or if it doesn't, then this is your only solution. Uh, something like this is your only solution to get uh, uh, audio out. Um, so compared to the uh, analog output uh, of your desktop, we expect these things to have a lot more output uh, as far as just sheer power of driving headphones. Otherwise, there's no point in having these. Whether they provide additional fidelity, that's a secondary thing to have an adequate power and we'll be measuring that uh, on this thing. So this is what it looks like. Let's uh, get into the review that I posted last night. Um, click in my window here. So I uh, do this test in uh, two phases in that at first I treat all of these as if they're just a standalone DAC, uh, meaning I don't try to load the output with a headphone style load. Uh, so it's the least stressful situation, which is what a DAC would see when he's driving a preamplifier as opposed to a headphone. And uh, for that, I try to adjust the output to two volts if I can and uh, see what the performance is. So again, it's the best case performance. With AudioQuest uh, uh, Cobalt, when I uh, ran my dashboard test, I, uh, the signal is always 0 dB FS, which means it's at maximum digital value, peak to peak of the sine wave. When I did that, performance was horrendous. Uh, this sine ad, which indicates noise and distortion, just sank all the way down to 25 or 30. These distortion bars were way the heck up here and a clear sign that the uh, device wasn't designed to be driven at full amplitude. A um, lot of music these days is mixed near zero because of these loudness wars. So you don't want a uh, DAC to uh, um, clip or overload in, in, in that case. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I knocked it down one dB and that was enough to get rid of the severe clipping and uh, that gave me the two volt nominal, which is what a, a DAC should produce. Uh, and uh, performance still pretty dismal. Uh, sine add again is a, is a measure of all these harmonics added together and the noise floor of the DAC combined. And uh, we're getting somewhere between 74 and 78, depending on what channel you look at. You average them up, you get about, I don't know, 75 uh, or so, 76. And that places the uh, um, AudioQuest uh, Cobalt um, second worst <laughs> dongle I've ever tested. Uh, there's, I don't know, 25, 30 of them in here, if not more. And anything bucket red means it's just incompetent, uh, essentially at any price, uh, much less at $300. Uh, ideally, you get a device that's in the green and blue is where you want it to be, not way the heck down here. So as a pure DAC, this is quite disappointing. Um, what's interesting is that this uses a pretty competent uh, a digital to analog converter from ESS that in desktop situation, it can actually be way above even these lines over here. So uh, quite surprising that it took a really good engine and then uh, uh, screwed up its output to, to be this bad. Now, sometimes um, the performance is better at lower voltages or lower output levels. So let's test for that. And uh, as you can see, performance 
just keeps getting worse the more you ask this device to produce output. Usually the curve sort of starts low because of the noise level that's dominant, and then it goes up and then it comes back down. Not here, basically, the more output you have, the worse the, app, the performance gets and distortion increases, and then it hits a point where it just clips and performance drops like a rock, and uh, that's all there is. Um, as a sign that there's a good engine in there uh, of that DAC is that when we just measure noise, not distortion, just measure noise, it's uh, extremely good. It's not the best, but it's way up there. This is producing basically 20 bits of uh, dynamic range, so very quiet uh, internals in there. Uh, it's really the distortion that's the problem is all these tall spikes in here. The noise floor is, is pretty good. Uh, going back to the distortion, uh, people complain often that, you know, you're just running one sine wave as music, not one sine wave. So uh, I have a test where I run 32 sine waves at all different frequencies from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. And uh, an ideal output on this would be that the bottoms will be way down here and there, there won't be any of this busyness or grass, as we call it. Here we get really bad output with the distortions that are generated are covering all the way up to minus 80 dB. If we divide that by six, we get about 13 bits of distortion free range. So if you express this uh, clean area, you only have 13 bits. So I don't know, 40 years after CD format was started at uh, 16 bits, this device can't produce 16 bits. I think, you know, anything about 13 bits is just pure distortion and, and junk. I don't know who can argue that this is euphonic or sounds good. It's just garbage that's just gonna hide detail in your music. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I noticed in the description, it talked about it has a slow filter. Uh, so I figured I'd go ahead and measure the filter response. And the way I do that is that I feed the, the DAC white noise and white noise has all frequencies in it. So this will go on infinity. Every DAC needs a filter and this one has a filter, but this filter is very slow. An ideal filter for this sample rate would truncate everything at this blue line. That doesn't always, most of the time that doesn't happen. Most stacks have a, what I call lazy rollout. Um, but uh, the laziness is not as lazy as this. And also they don't uh, um, bring down the levels of audible, audible band too much. Uh, there's about five or six dB droop over here at 20 kilohertz. Fortunately, most of us don't hear that, but if we did hear it, you know, you're basically losing some of your highs in there. So not good. Um, this is done because of this notion that uh, normal uh, DAC filters are sharper and are flat in the audible band. Uh, ring, uh, meaning that they oscillate and then they have a spike and then they oscillate. Uh, that only happens with an artificial test signal and impulse, doesn't happen with music. But what the heck, we'll go ahead and run a square wave test. And indeed, we see that there is uh, uh, only pulse ringing. So the signal comes and we see the ringing after it. We don't see any ringing before it. So it's doing what he it says it's doing, even though audibility of this thing is quite suspect, this kind of filter. But uh, despite the fact that I'm running this at minus 2 dB uh, full scales, not even 1, we see the tops of these things, I don't know if you can see, they're flat. There should be little points like this, not flattened. When they're flattened, meaning that uh, the uh, DAC is internally digitally clipping. And when it clips, it generates distortion. So this is not good. It's an overflow. Digital systems cannot handle overflow. Uh, they, they're great till you get to zero and then they can't go above zero. So there's a signal processing error here. Uh, it's rather common. Uh, it happens, so uh, uh, but still not forgivable. Yeah, and we don't want clipping in the name of a code a DAC uh, filter that we can't even quantify what it does for us. It uh, gets rid of some of our frequency response up here, and then it gets and it then clips in in uh, time domain. So not good. But this Shackle high personality continues when I test for uh, accuracy of of the output. Uh, in a linearity test is exceptionally good. It's almost textbook perfect, all the way up to 20 bits again, 120, minus 120 dB. 
So there's great performance there. It's great performance in our jitter test. Yes, there's some unwanted spikes here. You should only see this one spike in the middle. That's our test signal. Everything else should be, you know, shouldn't be there. We've seen these little uh, ticks in here, and that's common, especially in this class device. But the levels are all below minus 130 dB and lower, so absolutely inaudible um, uh, on this thing. So definitely not a concern. So performance goes from being, you know, really tr uh, terrible to really good. Now, a lot of these things where I've shown you, it's not clear that, you know, uh, average person even hears this high uh, distortion. Uh, hear distortions, you need training and and write content to hear it. And uh, at this level, I think most audiophiles wouldn't hear these artifacts, even though, you know, ideally you'd want to get a piece of hardware that doesn't have those problems. So, but what you do hear is power, as I mentioned at the start of this review, in that if you run out of power, Either the thing doesn't get loud enough to drive your headphone or it will get severely distorted. In this case, when I'm running a 300 ohm load, which simulates some like a Sennheiser HD650 or HD6XX series, uh, headphones are quite popular. For these, we measure, uh, we keep increasing the input relative uh, and measure what comes out as far as output uh, watts in here and how much distortion we get. Uh, once again, we see this is a very high distortion device in that, you know, before you even get to 0.1 milliwatts, this is 0.1, we're already having distortion taken over and increasing with level. And uh, then it gets to a point of about 12 milliwatts, and then it jumps up uh, and clips. So, you know, this is your usable ranges in here. So if I take that 12 milliwatt and I plot it with all the other dongles like this that I've tested, it lands in here. Uh, your phone it like, is way down here, like this HTC, I think it's the HTC phone. I don't know if I can see my, oh, here we go. My, I think this is my Samsung phone, I'm not sure. But if you have a regular phone with, without a, a dongle, uh, other than some LG phones, uh, you're way down here. So there's plenty more power than your uh, typical uh, uh, either phone or if you buy little dongles like the Apple dongle, here's three and a half uh, milliwatts. This thing puts out 12 milliwatts. So it's four times more powerful than the Apple dongle, which is actually a good dongle. Um, the Google and others, you could try to Look at the review online. So this is actually not bad. Uh, I'd like to see 14, 15, 16, which is what this is, or in case of higher end ones that have balanced outputs like this uh, uh, Hades uh, S9 in here, you can see that it puts out as much as 52 milliwatts, which is more than four times the power. So if you have power hungry, high impedance headphones, you may have trouble with this. Um, we then go to the other extreme because headphones come in all kinds of impedances. Um, that was a test of a high impedance. Uh, we want to test low impedance because low impedance stresses current delivery and a, and a headphone app may be good at voltage and not current or vice versa. Ideally, it would be, it would be good at both. So here we see a similar picture where distortion rises early again. And this time though, we don't have a lot of power. It's 26 milliwatts. And if we plot that against all the other dongles and the phones that I've tested, now it lands way down here. Um, it should really be in this category uh, over here. So this tells me that if you have a high impedance headphone, this dongle will probably do okay. But if you have a low impedance uh, uh, headphone uh, that lands in this 25, 30 ohm range, you're not gonna have a lot of power. And depending on the efficiency of that uh, headphone, you may uh, uh, have clipping issues or volume issues. Indeed, that's what happens. So I always test with two headphones, one at high impedance, one at low impedance for that same reason. With Sennheiser HD650, I thought this sounded excellent. Um, uh, plenty of volume, plenty of punch, plenty of dynamics, detail. Uh, what distortion was there, I couldn't hear it by just listening with just one sample. Maybe if I did an A-B test between this and, and another lower distortion one, I could hear a difference. But, uh, you know, for practice, uh, as a matter of practice, uh, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, it's with the high impedance. Then a uh, second test I do is that I have this Ether CX uh, from Drop. Uh, it's only 25 ohm uh, impedance. Uh, I tested with that and at very low volume, it sounded fine. But the moment I got to medium volume, 
it was already distorted. And by the time I got it to max volume, it was severely distorted. Not a subtle thing, maybe not just a little bit bright or anything. It was just completely gone. It was basically operating in the clipping region over here uh, on this thing where distortion just goes through the roof. It's almost as strong as the signal itself. And there's no mistaking it. You, you know, if you listen to any headphone in this range, you're already in trouble. Down here, yeah, this this may be hard to hear, but clearly the you know I needed more power than 26 milliwatts to drive this. <coughs> excuse me, um, Ether CX headphone, and that's unfortunate. And uh, whereas if I test with the exact same two headphones, Ether CX with any of the ones in here, sound is beautiful. Um, you can get the recently uh, reviewed uh, THX uh, Onyx uh, one or uh, uh, E1DA or uh, Tempo Tech. There's just a ton of choices in here, and they're all much cheaper than this, and they just have tremendous performance. So, what's going on in here? Basically, it looks like there's some subsystem is good in here, but the, basically, the headphone amplifier is junk. Um, it doesn't have enough power, uh, and it generates a lot of distortion. And AudioQuest is getting unlucky in some extent is that they're sitting on their laurels with this design. They were one of the early pioneers uh, in this area, made this category quite popular. But uh, some eight or 10 years gone by and the race has moved on and people are now producing these little dongles like this. That, by the way, um, come with USB-C, so you just have a little cable connecting to your phone, connecting this to your phone is pretty onerous because you need a big adapter that then dangles from your phone and having more weight is not a good thing. And even if you plug this into a laptop, if you walk away with your headphone, you can break the ex uh, expensive USB uh, jack in your uh, laptop. These new ones where they have, you know, either a small cable attached or, or at least USB-C are much nicer. And then some of them like this one actually have um, volume up and down, which is very, very good rather than trying to reach into the device, uh, reach into the phone and try to change the volume uh, on this thing. So where does it net out? Terrible. I mean, they could have measured all these things, found these problems and fixed them, come up with a better implementation. I don't know if they didn't measure, they didn't understand, they didn't compare or what it is, but I personally wouldn't buy this at any price. Uh, you know, $50, I can get a far better device than this thing. And I just see no reason for this to exist uh, whatsoever. Uh, yes, at high impedance, it will sound fine with high impedance headphones. And I'm sure all those uh, reviewers online that gush over it are probably just using either very easy to drive headphone or one that's high impedance. And that defeats the purpose of spending $300 because you won't spend $300 so that whatever headphone you buy in the future, you don't have to buy this again. This is not a $10 item you throw away, get another one um, when you buy a new headphone. Um, so, uh, and, and at any rate, there's nothing that I can justify it should cost $300. I think $150 is the limit of what you want to pay. THX Onyx is $200, so a little bit of a stretch there, but otherwise, there's just no reason to pay $300 for anything. It's not jewelry. It doesn't, it's not something you're going to show off to people. It literally shouldn't exist, but exists, and it sells strongly. I think there were 2,000 reviews on Amazon alone, and uh, all those people are, I guess they don't know about us and don't know about the reviews I do, and, you know, charts like this where so many better products exist than this one and tend to go spend the money on this. So it's a classic case of... Uh, writing a brand and, and reputation rather than a proper design. Uh, the other versions of AudioQuest Dragonfly don't do well either, by the way. The red one is not competitive and the plain one is not either, although they're at least more in the ballpark than this one is. They don't clip as easily as this and at least you don't pay as much for them. So really no reason to buy this. Uh, anybody who gushes over it, you know, I suggest not watching their channel, read their reviews again, because I tell you, you throw away all the measurements and just look at the, just listen to it. You hook up a proper headphone to it and it's distorting. Uh, it's just, you know, open and shut case uh, on this thing at $300. So, all right. Hopefully uh, you got something out of this review. Uh, see you in a future one. Bye-bye.